writer, filmmaker, and director Young Jin Lee. <laughs> and the doctoral students in our program nominate and elect an individual or an organization that had a significant impact on theater and performance in New York City. Now in its fourth decade, the award has provided a unique opportunity to bring the professional and academic theater communities together, and tonight, I'm excited to say we're doing it again. <laughs> In 2005, Young Jin's Songs of the Dragons Flying to Heaven was presented at the Seagull Center's Prelude Festival, which is dedicated to discovering new artists at the forefront of contemporary New York City theater, dance, interdisciplinary, and mediatized performance. Young Jin Lee has continued to push the boundaries of contemporary theater with each work and has been called the most adventurous downtown playwright of her generation by the New York Times and one of the best experimental playwrights in America by Time Out New York. It is my greatest pleasure to honor her as our 36th Edwin Booth Award recipient. Yeah. Um, this ceremony is made possible by gracious support from the Doctoral Students Council, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, and the Doctoral Theater Students Association. And I'd like to give special thanks to our professors, Marvin Carlson, David Savran, and Jean Graham Jones for their gracious support. Um, five years ago, I saw Young Jin Lee's piece, We're Gonna Die, for the first time. This was back in Seoul, right around the time I had gotten the word of my admission for, to our program. And at the time, I could, have, I could never have imagined that I'd be producing and speaking at an award ceremony honoring her. <laughs> and I still can't believe our paths have crossed this way. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker for the night, doctoral student Nina Angela Mercer. Unfortunately, Nina could not be here with us tonight, but she sent along a video recording. So here's Nina. <laughs> sometimes magic and urgency. It's sometimes big belly laughter bursting from someone's chest in the house at the strangest moment, revealing some mystery of perception. I believe in the way theater makes worlds that simply don't exist except in our imaginations and sometimes on the stage. And I believe in playwrights, brazenly audacious playwrights bold enough to do this crazy work be picked apart, adored, ignored, misunderstood, troubled by night sweats before opening night, cold crowds and reviewers, actors who just want to stick to the script. <laughs> so I watched The Shipment by Young Jin Lee online because I believe in theater. For those who don't know, the shipment unpacks black stereotypes. The first half of the play is presented as a vaudeville show, right with the most reproduced stereotypes of blackness in performance. We are all always performing against them somehow, I guess, in someone's mind, most often not our own. For the second half of the play, the black cast members provided the playwright with roles they wished they would play. She created a naturalistic drama in response to that with those characters. Back in February, I listened to Brandon Jacob Jenkins, Alethea Harris, Jackie Sibley's Drury, all in conversation at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. This is going to make sense, hold tight. <laughs> to get inside the auditorium there at the Schomburg, you literally have to walk on top of a Congo cosmogram, a portal, if you will, under which lie Langston Hughes' ashes. And on this particular evening, these black playwrights were talking about the representation of blackness in theater, asking what is real black, what is authentically black, what voices are allowed to be black, the black playwright, someone else, neither. In that moment, I wish Langston Hughes was in the back of the Schomburg Auditorium with me throwing back a drink at a makeshift bar. <laughs> there was no bar. But afterward, I thought, I don't want to hear another conversation about what blackness isn't, because it just is. I don't want to hear another conversation about what blackness sounds like. It just is in all of its variations. I want a flood of soulful plays, spilling hearts all over the place, killing us softly like 
like Roberta said, and making methods of everything we thought we knew. Whether this is possible or not, I know theater is a place for the impossible, so I can say this here. I can own it here. I think freedom is really good to imagine, and I know it must be funky, like steak face funky, and it must make you question whether the sky is falling and the ground broken free from gravity and somebody sucker punched you and you deserved it. I do not think theater should have lights as if it were Facebook. Posts, or worse, those red, red hearts that aren't hearts at all, but kind of love, rebranded. So I will say this without reading likes or whatever. Young Jean Lee, the shipment is a black soul play, and many representations of blackness. But it is black in other ways too, and it is you, and every actor on that stage, and maybe some imaginary friend of someone's too, or a nightmare. It could very well be a black nightmare in a white person's mind, or vice versa, channeled through you, a Korean American woman, or maybe it's what these black actors dream they could be. Whether black or unmarked by skin, a thumb, nose, or a middle finger at all the struggle for gigs they've known, it could be. But yes, it is also about race, and it is funky trouble, and I thank you. While I watched, I did not laugh, not once. But I wasn't in the audience. I felt no need to perform, nor could I catch the spirit of my neighbor's laughter. I was alone at home, and it's no longer 2009. Barack Obama is not the president, and no one says post-racial much anymore. Instead, I am the silence and the screw face watching from my desk chair. I think your play, young Jean Lee, unleashed something inside me that I did not know was barking in the first place. It felt a little like iodine on an always open wound that's mostly undetectable. We're good at hiding for survival, you know. But you call people out with your worlds on stage, and that play felt a little like some blackness I know, some whiteness too. The struggle against the box meant to hold all of us, but it also felt like nothing I've ever known, and that is right and good. Because as I said in the beginning, theater creates worlds, impossible worlds, and asks the most dangerous questions. And I wonder, if you gathered those same actors today and asked them what roles they want to play or what blackness, or not blackness at all, simply humanness, from inside their vexed subjectivities, what would they say? I believe you would confront that particular storm Young Jing Lee, I believe you would commit to lines on the page and sit in the house and listen to your audience, no matter how uncomfortable. I can tell because you are audacious. I applaud you and implore you to keep making us uncomfortable. Clearly, we need it. And up next is a stage reading by doctoral students Ash Marinaccio, Ayul Akinci, Jessica Adam, and Jenny Youssef. They will read a scene from Straight White Men, which played to great critical acclaim in 2014 at the Public Theater. And this summer, the play is returning to mark its uh, as mark the first play by an Asian American female playwright to be produced on Broadway. Yeah. <laughs> Ed, the father. Matt, the elder. Jake, the middle. Drew, the youngest. So Matt, tell me why you're interested in working for our foundation. Uh, because I guess I'm interested in the job because I, uh, I graded a lot of papers while I was in grad school. Um, <laughs> I graded a lot of papers and they were, um, I have that skill, so, um, which is not to say that I have any of the actual copy editing skills required for this job, but um, <laughs> I'm assuming I could learn them if, if you know I, I were taught. Matt, that was great. No, it wasn't. That was terrible. 
It was? <laughs> Dad, <laughs> I think you're moving a little fast here. Matt needs to deal with a whole bunch of shit before he can handle something like this. No, he could do it if he wanted. He could do it in his sleep. He's just choosing not to. I'm not qualified for this job. It doesn't matter what skills you have. You have to make yourself qualified. How? I'll, I'll show you. Watch. I'm Ed. Uh, thanks for coming in. No problem. <laughs> thanks for having me. Uh, so, Matt, uh, tell me a little about why you are interested in working for our foundation. Well, Sam told me about the position. That sounds great. He uh, spoke very highly of you. Yeah, well, he's a great friend. We met on our year abroad to Ghana when we were both at Harvard. Ghana? That's an interesting choice. We were a part of a project that trained villagers in rural areas to build sustainable housing. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> anyway, I've been a fan of your organization for a long time. You guys set the standard for international human rights, and it would be a dream to work with you in any capacity. Matt, your resume shows a BA from Harvard. 10 years in Stanford's PhD program and 15 years at various nonprofits and community organizations. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, for a long time I thought I might stay in academia, but it started to feel too theoretical. I wanted to put some of that theory into practice. I felt strongly about working with a smaller, more grassroots organizations, but I realized I need to be part of a bigger organization with a broader impact. <laughs> Where do you see yourself five years from now? Well, eventually I'd like to work in the press office. Why the press office? Because that's where the greatest impact happens. That's how people all over the world learn that human rights violations will not be tolerated. Well, I must say, Matt, I'm impressed. It was very nice to meet you. We'll be in touch soon. It was great meeting you. Good work, Jake. Thanks, Dad. <coughs> Matt, you could do that if you wanted to. Not if he doesn't think he deserves anything. Harping on his resume, you're just making things worse. No, the real problem is Matt can't work for a bunch of privileged first worlders who use human Ooh. rights as an excuse to slap the world around with their Western okay, dick. Let's not get into that again. <laughs> Matt, <laughs> did you see what he did there? Yes, I did. Now you try. I saw Jake do it, Dad. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> now I'd like to see you try. You don't have to do this, Matt. It's what Dad wants. Oh, you can't come in like that. <laughs> like how? Your shoulders are hunched and you're not making eye contact. You need to walk in confidently and with your head up. Come in again. <clears throat> Much better. Nice to meet you. I'm Ed. Matt. Ah, firm handshake. Very good. Sit down. Um, so Matt, tell me why you're interested in working for our company, uh, foundation. Uh, because... I got that, Matt. Um, Sam told me about the job. And how do you know Sam? Um, we met, um, we met at Harvard. No, actually in Ghana, um, we were, <laughs> we were both at Harvard at the time, but we were doing our year abroad in in Ghana, so we, we were in Ghana when we met. And what were you doing in Ghana? Um, well, at least in my case, I, I was teaching a bunch of people something that they didn't want to know, and uh, <laughs> I didn't know how to do, and they didn't want to learn. Oh, come on. <laughs> I'm sure you're underselling yourself. No, I felt like an idiot, and the worst part about it... Why don't you uh, tell me 
a little bit about how you got here from academia. Ah, uh, well, um, <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to put theory into practice. Can you be a bit more specific? There were, there were things I wasn't smart enough to figure out in academia, so um, I'm, I'm trying to figure them out in real life. How can you say that you're not smart? It's not that I'm not smart, it's that I'm not smart enough. I, I don't know, maybe nobody is. I'm afraid I don't understand. What were you trying to figure out? How to be useful, how to not make things worse. Matt, I see from your resume <laughs> that you have a lifelong commitment to social justice. With your background and all these references, why haven't you done anything useful? I don't, I don't know. Dad, Matt's interview skills aren't the problem. He's trapped in a sick way of thinking. Drew, stop helping. You're, you're wait, not a good actor. Wait a minute. <laughs> I've just been sitting here. I've barely said anything. All I'm trying to do is help. Yeah, by continually insisting that there's something wrong with because you. Because I care about you. I'm just trying to be useful. That's it. What's wrong with that? You're not happy. Don't you want that? Honestly, Drew, everything was fine before you guys got here. So you were loving doing temp work. It's a decent organization. Somebody has to do what they have me doing. And you want to keep doing that forever. I can't do it forever. It's a temp job. Jesus. <laughs> Nothing escapes this vortex of negativity. That's not negative. He's not lazy. He doesn't lack self-confidence. He's not afraid to risk. You believe a guy like you is supposed to sit down and shut the fuck up. Nobody's ever told me to shut up. Of course not, because you've always done such a good job of taking the back seat. All your female and queer and minority coworkers probably don't even know you're there. You're being an ally, putting yourself in a service position, right? Making copies for the oppressed. You're trying to live in accordance with what you believe. What's that? That people like us can do, that people like us, that there's nothing people like us can do in the world that isn't problematic or evil, so we have to make ourselves invisible. People like us? What's that supposed to mean? Oh, you know, privileged white dickheads. Women and minorities may get to pretend they're doing enough to make the world a better place just by getting ahead, but a white guy is pretty hard, to pre pretty hard pressed to explain why the world needs him to succeed. So Matt's trying to stay out of the way. Jake, you keep saying this and I find it very hard to believe. It's because nobody else would ever do it. Matt's a freak. Jake! <laughs> Imagine as a compliment. It's a world of pigs and Matt's not a pig, but if you're not a pig, you're fucked. But look at me. I'm an asshole, but people kind of like me whether they know it or not. <laughs> you're not as big an asshole as you think you are. Yes. I am. <laughs> My company is run almost entirely by white guys and I do nothing about it. I make ironically racist jokes. I give straight guys shit about being gay. I talk about which one of our interns I want to fuck. As much as I'd like to bring someone other than a white guy to that client meeting, the clients don't want it, so I don't do it. Together with my ex-wife, I'm raising our kids to be as white as possible, except for when their blackness makes them more appealing tokens. So it's good to know that Matt is out there doing what he thinks is right, being a martyr, so I don't have to. That's not what I'm doing. <laughs> yes, yes, you are. You're making sacrifices for people who are other. But what are they sacrificing to make the world better? Nothing. They don't want you. They don't even want each other. They want me. Jake, I don't believe the things you think I believe. Maybe I used to, but. What? What do you believe? I don't know. I don't know anything. So you don't even have your fucked up principles? You're a loser for no reason? Hey! <laughs> <laughs> then you might as well be dead. Jake, stop. What? 
For the past three days, I have had to incessantly think about what a horrible person I am for not being a martyr like Matt, only to find out he's not doing anything other than being a loser piece of shit for no reason, reaffirming the total hopelessness of everything. Matt, I want to kill you. I want to kill you. I am going to kill you. Kill me. <laughs> I will. I'll kill you. Don't kill your brother. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking kill me. <laughs> Edmondson, a doctoral candidate, will conduct a public interview with Young Jin Lee. The interview will be followed by a Q&A. Please help, help me welcome our interviewer and our guest of honor who flew all the way from Stanford for tonight's event, the 2018 Booth Award recipient, Young Jin Lee. I'm going to go ahead and just out myself as a Young Jean Lee fangirl. Um, I'm completely a biased interviewer here. Um, so, <laughs> so we'll just put that out there. Um, uh, you've been, your work has been really important to me um, as, a, as a PhD student, but also as a person that's alive in the world with thoughts and feelings and experiences. And I know that that's the case for a lot of us in this room right now and, and people in our department that aren't here today. Um, so kind of as a result of that, I've reached out online for um, students to put together questions. So a lot of these are mine, but a lot of them are coming from the student body. Um, a little bit more about my personal experience with your work um, as it leads into the first question I have for you tonight. Um, I came to your work at a really difficult time in my life. I'm sure you get unloaded on like this all the time, but here we go again, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> uh, I, had just, <laughs> I had just moved to New York City and, um, and I was going to start this program, this PhD program, and my sister died. And she, um, it wasn't a huge surprise because she was struggling with alcohol abuse and substance abuse and, and she um, was struggling with, with mental illness. So, but it was also like kind of the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And it put me in a really weird place to start a PhD program. I was just not really sort of in a good emotional place and not really caring about anything, let alone theater and performance studies. Um, and I have a good friend, Ricardo Montes, who's over teaching at the New School now. I think you might know him or you've met him before. And he, um, he suggested that I go see your play, We're Gonna Die. He was like, I think this is what you need right now. And I was like, I don't know what I need right now, but it's probably not theater. <laughs> and, I, and I went and he was absolutely right. I mean, um, not only did that play draw out the deep sadness of morbidity and sort of death and tragedy, but it also, makes light of it and there's humor and there's beauty and it's universally human. Um, so I was really glad to see that Diana O and, and Matt Park are gonna play that song for us at the end of, of the night today because that's the song we chose um, to have at my sister's um, uh, uh, funeral service. So um, it, it was very important to me. We did it on a, on a beach at sunrise in South Texas. So um, that it's very personal, and I'm so so honored to be in your presence today. And I teach the play to my students, and they love it. It's always their favorite play of the semester. So enough about me. Um, in light of this, <laughs> in light of this, <laughs> that was intense. Sorry, <laughs> but it's coming from the heart. Oh, yeah. um, I mean, I I, uh, I have been in such 
fear of this event because I like just the mere thought of the award makes me want to cry. And so I was just like, I can't, you know, I can't just cry through the whole thing. And then like you just tell like the most yeah. heartrending. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, just like deep breathing. <laughs> We're so glad to have you here. And, and to kind of flip the script on this um, story I've just told you, is there anyone, any artist, any person that has sort of helped you get through difficult times, either creatively or personally? Um, oh man, this is like another crying topic. Like I, okay. Uh, so um, yes, he's sitting right there. His name is Mike Ferry, and he is my uh, dramaturg of the past 15 years. And um, we met actually in our PhD program uh, at English PhD program at Berkeley, and um, we both dropped out. Yeah. And um, uh, and we have been working together ever since. He's worked on every single show. Um, with me just side by side. And you know, as many of you probably know, um, you know, when you are trained as a critic and in that critical mindset, it's very, very difficult to then cross over into the creative um, because you are trained to basically be a huge jerk. Um, you know, to you know, a, towards creative things, right? And so like when you are um, when you're creating a work of art, you know, in the beginning, you know, it's always bad. I mean, I guess I hear sort of mythical tales of writers who just like wrote the most famous play ever in one week, but I sort of don't believe it. Like I believe that they, you know, that there was development happening during the rehearsal process. So like, but, um, you know, but for me in particular, um, the beginning stages of writing, the writing is so bad and just uh, the critic in me is so completely vicious with that poor little artist who's just trying to take her fir fa first baby steps into this project. And, um, and so Mike, um, you know, he does, he does so much, but like one of the huge things that he's done is, um, basically, you know, I, I don't think I could have done it without him, like shut off the viciousness of that critic brain. And, uh, you know, he has just, uh, he, he has sort of like, you know, the most empathy of anybody I've ever met. And he really just helped me, you know, to survive. I mean, I can't tell you how many, Oh man, and it's not even bad at the beginning. Like it's bad for years, you know, like the shipment, you know, um, we heard that amazing uh, testimonial to the shipment. I mean, the shipment, the first two workshops that I did, I mean, the first one in particular was so racist and horrible, like not even like, you know, controversial, like it was just flat out, just racist. Um, and we, we, we did not intend it, um, but it, <laughs> was and uh, and I just remember the horror of like this mostly white audience just roaring with laughter and um, sort of like you know engaging in uh, um, in, you know, sort of feeling like they were being given permission to engage in this like super racist stuff. And then like, you know, the, the black friends and relatives of the cast members like walked out, you know, completely upset from the theater. And, you know, and this, this type of thing goes on sometimes for a really long time, you know, where it's just really bad for a while. And, um, uh, and, and so Mike, you know, I, I just don't know what I would do without him because he uh, he's just so, um, so completely good at his job and um, so good at keeping the project on track and so good at keeping sort of as much as possible, like my ego out of the way. Well, we're grateful for Mike, too. <laughs> um, so as your Facebook friend, I have been, we're Facebook friends, by the way. Um, <laughs> I have a, I, and ever, now everyone knows that, so I feel really good. Um, I've noticed that you network a lot with all sorts of really interesting artists and um, activists and scholars on Facebook. And another colleague in the program, Elise and I were talking about how we love your Facebook page because there's always like juicy things going on there, some sort of relevant discourse, which looks totally different from like most pages that you go on. Um, so how do you view your, your relationship with social media? And, and I see you as using it as sort of a crowdsourcing way of, of working through stuff, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, how, how do you view the way that you use it? Um, 
Well, a lot of times, uh, it, it, I mean, the way that I work is just so intensely collaborative, you know, so like Mike is sort of like my main person, but then there's the cast and then there's everybody involved with the production. There's, you know, assistant dramaturgs, um, my associate director, you know, like there's all of these people who are just intensely involved in the creative process with me. So I'm used to, um, you know, when I'm writing, when I'm directing, just having a room full of people with me um, at all times and everybody is just shouting stuff out and it's it's just tons of feedback all the time and we invite people into the room and they shout out feedback so it's just constant this sort of cacophony of information um, that I have become very used to like filtering um, and Facebook is you know when I'm just alone trying to write by myself and I don't have that room full of people around me and Mike's at work um, and I can't text him, uh, <laughs> then it's you know Facebook actually functions very similarly to that um, rehearsal room where you know I just ask a question and then immediately I have um, you know uh, all of these really smart responses and so it's really like having a very diverse group of collaborators that I can call on and. Um, uh, and before, um, uh, before 11-9, um, uh, uh, um, when uh, our current president was elected, uh, it, it was m much more um, oriented towards the, uh, just the collaboration and like working on things. And um, since that has happened, uh, I have been, uh, you know, I was just so, uh, you know, I was distraught uh, by that event, you know, in part, you know, just because it was it was a terrible thing to, to have happened, but also um, just thinking about how um, little I had been thinking during the Obama years, like just how 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 uncritical I was, just how I was not paying attention to what was going on, and how I was just thinking like, oh, well, Obama's president, so I don't have to care about what's happening in the world, and I I think that that was that was the thing that I felt the most terrible about. And so, you know, since then I have been, you know, really um, making such an effort to um, to know what's going on and to, um, you know, and to question more and to be more critical. And that journey has been sort of a parallel track on Facebook that is sort of starting to dovetail with my work now. But for a while it was just um, sort of distress and, you know, trying to be a better citizen. Thanks for that. Um, so tying into your use of Facebook, um, uh, one of your posts talked about your complicated relationship with academia. Yeah. Um, and I hope, <laughs> what, what we hope with this, um, this, this event is that you do realize that your decision to focus on your work has been in incredibly valuable to people in institutions and, and beyond. Um, so we're, we're glad you made the decisions that you did. Um, but playing, it's kind of come full circle now because you're a professor, you're teaching, and um, playing to our audience here, um, oh, I'm curious of what is your teaching style and do you have any um, juicy student stories or anything like that? <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, seeing as how it's, uh, this is being live streamed, it's probably not a good idea for me to, <laughs> if I want to continue uh, teaching. Um, to expose my um, uh, my juicy teaching stories, but uh, you know, uh, for me, academia was um, uh, you know I've uh, actually like based on a recent Facebook post about academia, I've learned that there are um, you know there are academics <coughs> whose minds just love to push themselves to the extremes of abstraction, right? Like where it's just like there's all of these systems and your brain sort of holding them all in place at once and it's just, you know, it's just so many degrees removed from, um, uh, you know, from anything you can actually hold. Like it's just so purely intellectual and I, you know, I have uh, encountered people who just love that experience, you know, and for them, um, I mean, I think one woman said that she can't, um, she can't, you know, boil an egg, uh, but she can do that, you know, so for her, that act of like, you know, going into like level after level of abstraction is, feels natural and like something she's competent at, but pretty much anything else in the world would be difficult, you know, and so, 
Uh, I am definitely not that person. I'm probably the most, like, I'm very, very extreme opposite to that um, in the sense that uh, if something isn't practically applicable, um, I just have a very hard time wrapping my mind around it. And so um, for me in academia, it was this very strange experience of um, I would read this stuff and I would like listen to people talk and then, you know, I would just sort of say stuff that sounded you know, I, you know, I'd be like, okay, these are the words that you use, and like, what's what's a crazy way of using those words that like is just doesn't make any sense? And everybody would say like, amazing, like that's 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 so interesting, you know, and and um and it, and and at the time I was like, what is going on? Because these were very smart people who were doing, and like they weren't like these jerks who were just pretending, you know, like it wasn't an emperor's. Well, in some cases, I think it, it might have been other people like me who didn't know what was going on. But there were people who were just like, they could take my nonsense and actually map it in the grid of the abstraction, like because that's how good they were, right? So they, you could just say something that just a string of nonsense words, and they would be like, I, I am now mapping it in the grid, and this makes sense. So, uh, so um, but for me, I didn't have the grid, and I didn't understand what anybody was saying, and, um, uh, and I, I felt uh, stupid. Um, and also just like a lot of the rhetoric of criticism is sort of, you know, this is why my argument is better than, all, like all these people are old fashioned and racist and, you know, like, you know, they're bad uh, because their arguments are stupid. But then here is my argument that's really smart. And here's all these other smart people that, you know, support my argument. And, um, uh, <laughs> and uh, so that was kind of like the rhetorical framework of the thing, you know, which is, it, and it's just, it, it's just a rhetorical frame. Well, like it's just this, you know, practical thing that people use in order to, um, you know, justify their positions, you know, like, but, cause I, I mean, I don't think, like most people probably don't actually believe like my idea is the most, or maybe some people do, but I, uh, but, for me, it was just, I'm so literally, I'm so literal minded. So I was like, when I was trying to write my dissertation and really when I tried to write anything, I was like, oh my God, like I have to make the most true best argument that has ever been made about this. And I don't even know what that is. And I don't, you know, and it was just, um, it was just so terrible. And so like eventually I had to drop out and I had, I was such a devoted academic. I mean, I think that's something that people don't know about me was that like freshman year, I was just like, I want to be a Shakespeare scholar and I devoted myself. I mean, I studied so hard, like all the way through undergrad. Um, I, um, uh, I went straight through into grad school. Like I was, um, uh, I was like a research assistant to Stephen Greenblatt. Like I did my honors thesis with him, and I, um, uh, and I, uh, and it, it was, it was just. I was very, very serious about it, and it was just very heartbreaking to me that I was too stupid to continue. I mean, that's really what it felt like. Um, uh, and um, and so when I left, it was just probably like the biggest heartbreak because it. You know, I had devoted, because I was ABD, you know, I went through orals, like I did my prospectus conference, I was like working on my dissertation, and um, just the level of failure that you feel when you've devoted your entire adult life to pursuing a dream that you then just can't execute because your brain, like, you don't understand, you know, and, um, uh, uh, oh, 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 and also here's the other, here's, here's the other fun thing, here's the other fun thing, which is that not only, like, so not only am I stupid, like, it's like, the reason why I'm stupid is because I'm evil. Because, because, because I, I'm so, um, you know, because I'm so committed to, like, the patri the hetero, norm the hetero patriarchy, you know, like, the white hetero patriarchy, and I want language to be this way, and I want to talk about beauty, and so I'm evil. And so that's why I'm stupid. And so that was sort of, like, how how I left grad school in shame. Uh, and, then, and then it was in this mindset that I was trying to then be an artist and like, make, you know, like it was just like this sort of like brutal attitude towards myself where I, I am then trying to like create. So that was a very difficult process. But um, I have noticed that 
Uh, you know, I'm now in theater, you know, drama departments, theater and performance studies. I mean, I do think that, uh, and I've now like read the criticism that has been written about my work, um, you know, for example, by Kieran Shimokawa and, um, uh, and the, and the, and, you know, it's, it's written mostly by theater and performance studies, uh, people and I can understand the articles and they <laughs> don't have the, like, I'm the genius over all these stupid people. Like, it's just, it's, it's very different type of thing from what I was, you know, doing in the in the '90s. Uh, so, uh, um, so now, you know, I think that, uh, you know, being in these departments. I mean, still, like, I'm, you know, um, I'm at Stanford, and you know, all of the um, tenure track faculty, like, they're all like academics, you know. But, uh, you know, and um, and I'm coming in as a practicing artist, but it is. Uh, I don't know. Like, I mean, I, I'm definitely. Uh, you know, I always sort of the way that I've tried to avoid um, uh, students feeling alienated the way that I felt alienated is um, I will, uh, especially for freshmen and sophomores who are just coming in and they, you know, they haven't learned a lot of the vocabulary that is um, that gets used in um, these academic settings. Um, I, um, I'm very adamant. Uh, I'm very adamant about babbling. Um, you know, by which I mean when people just talk um, without trying to communicate. Um, and, uh, and I'm very strict about um, spacing out, and those two things go together. I'm like, I'm gonna control the babbling, but then you have to control the spacing out, right? Because if babbling is happening, like, of course you're gonna space out. Like, that's the only defense against babbling is to space out. But if the babbling doesn't happen, then you can't space out, and you're also not, um, uh, you're not allowed to, you know, um, uh, not ask what something is if you don't understand what it is. And so like all of these things, um, I have like very strict rules about making sure that people understand. And I, I'm always like looking around and I'm like, do you, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? You know, I do that constantly. I'm like, does everybody understand? And I'm like looking into their eyes suspiciously and everybody's like, yes, yes, we get it. <laughs> Great. I think we all want to take your class now. Um, so... One of my favorite shows, just to completely pivot, um, one of my favorite shows of yours was Untitled Feminist Show. And it totally electrified me. And um, I'm curious what you see um, your responsibilities as a playwright um, uh, is advancing the project of feminism in light of the Me Too movement and intersectionality and things like that that we're, that we're actually talking about right now. Um, you know, Untitled Feminist Show. Um, I'm working. Uh, I'm. I'm working on. A, I'm finishing up a script of it now, which is going to be published um, with Straight White Men um, this uh, at some point this summer. And I'm really excited about it because it's a, a show that doesn't have any dialogue in it, and it's all. Um, it's all basically stage directions and movement, and um, you know. The cast and I, like, we made the decision to put the word feminist in the title just to, um, as uh, a sort of public embracing of feminism. But that show, um, that show is actually not, it's not really about feminism. It's, I don't think it's really advancing feminism. Like, that is basically, like, you know, we were trying to make, you know, I, I don't know, like, I feel like there are entertainments, there are like popular Disney type of entertainments, like maybe like a child's response to Disney on Ice. I guess that's what I was looking for with Untitled Feminist Show, which you know didn't go over that well with the um, you know the the super like boundary pushing ex you know experimentalists, where they were just like this is like Disney on Ice for um, uh, for feminists, like you know. But 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 it was great, you know, like I, you know these these uh, uh, these lesbian couples in their fifties would come and they would have their arms around each other, and just be like laughing, and I di and they did seem like they were watching Disney on Ice for for. <laughs> them you know it was just like laughing and having a good time like this was not boundary pushing art this was not feminist boundary pushing art like it was just um you know i just wanted to make uh this gender fluid good time um and um, <laughs> that that was that show and and we just we just said it was feminist because we felt that um you know making creating a space for gender fluidity was a feminist act you know and we just wanted to put that but that actually ended up getting ended up getting 
us into trouble just because you know the word feminist comes up and then automatically it's like what's your thesis what's your thesis about feminism that's the best thesis in the world that's ever been you know <laughs> that's ever been um thought of and it's like i don't know <laughs> um so i want to i want to kind of turn to straight white men because we I, I would hate to neglect them um <laughs> in this in this interview um but we kind of Tying that in with um, with the Untitled Feminist Project and, and what your show and what you're talking about with um, with gender, um, Q and Kim, who's one of my colleagues here, she noticed that you modified and I have to read this because it's kind of complicated um, that you modified the earlier character of the stagehand in charge in the play to two characters, and um, that you said that you they should be played by gender nonconforming performers, preferably of color, and the performers playing person in, uh, in charge one and person in charge two should be empowered to say whatever they want to audience members. Can you tell us a little bit about that particular change and that choice? Um, well, in the original production that we did at the public, there was only one character who was performing all of that. And, um, uh, and we spoke to the performer, Elliot Genitopoulos, and, um, uh, and you know, there's something about being one that feels a little bit tokenizing, you know, where it's just like, oh, there's just one person representing, you know, all otherness for this show. And um, to have, um, you know, to have two people sends a little bit, it, it's like, you know, it's not just one person. Like there are more, you know, there are more, uh, there are, there's more than one person and they also were able to, um, uh, and, and another change that we made is that they interact with the audience before the show, um, and they, you know, one person takes one half and the other person takes the other half, and they, um, uh, and and also like another change is that they, um, they position the actors in the in, in into the into the scenes, and um, and for me, uh, those characters were important because, um, you know, the public theater was my first kind of non downtown space and i you know i have a lot of you know audience younger um audience members like a lot of um you know queer more diverse uh audience members who i i was just afraid that they would walk into um the public and you know the audience would be so sort of middle class and older and and whiter and they would feel like they didn't belong there and so that's why we blasted this hip-hop music which i noticed that you guys blasted the hip-hop um on the uh on the on the way in and uh and it was like specifically hip-hop uh by um female rappers with like very raunchy lyrics and um and that was me and and people think that i put that in just to torture the um the <laughs> regular audience mem the the public's audience members but I absolutely did not like it was actually meant to be like a nice thing you know like a like a welcoming gesture to um you know to you know to people who were not of the main demographic and um and also that was the purpose of the two people in in charge and I and and also like I I felt that um uh um you know, for me, you know, gender nonconforming trans um, characters were important to the play uh, because I feel like that, um, um, yeah, I feel like those identities are, um, you know, are still like too invisible in the world of performance. And I think that, uh, you know, for, you know, probably for the people in this room, um, you know, it wouldn't be that big a deal, you know, to see like a trans or gender non-conforming person sort of, um, you know, emceeing or hosting an event. But for um, a lot of the audience members um, in the spaces where this show is being done, um, I think it is, you know, a little bit mind blowing. So that's, um, you know, that's always kind of a line that I'm trying to walk where like there's one group of people where it's just like pretty much anything you do, they're going to roll their eyes, you know, because they've just like seen it all and like everything's cliched. Everything is, you know, um, uh, uh, is boring. And then on the, and on the other hand, on, like on this other side is, you know, when I, when I did a show at Steppenwolf in Chicago, um, I was told 
uh, pretty definitively by like a lot of people who were locals that the majority of my audience would not have ever heard the word privilege used in the way that um, it, it gets used these days among you know um, you know among academics and artists um, they they would have heard it in terms of like oh he's very privileged meaning he his, he comes from a lot of money but they would not have ever even thought or heard of the concept of white privilege and I refused to believe this actually like I was like this is impossible and then everybody you know all the you know everybody went and like they asked their grandparents and their parents and you know they said have you ever heard this term and they were like I don't know what you're talking about so um, so th there's this whole audience whose minds are like can be blown by like almost anything you know like if you just introduce the tiniest thing so it's just sort of trying to get this group of people to understand that you know like uh you know that I'm also sort of kind of interested in you know what happens with this group over here does that make sense totally and um congratulations on your success with the play by the way and it's about time that we have an Asian American woman um playwright on Broadway so we're all excited to go see that. Um, well, I mean, one thing I have to say really quickly about that, though, is yeah. that, um, you know, there, there's this sort of uh, idea that somehow the doors of Broadway have yeah. generously yeah. swung open to include me, you know, to include an Asian American female. Actually, that's not what happened. Um, this, this woman, Carol Rothman, who's the artistic director of Second Stage, which is a nonprofit theater, she bought, like, she had the theater buy um, the smallest Broadway house um, on Broadway so that she could put whoever she wanted there. So uh, I have basically been forced upon Broadway um, by this incredible person and the Great, other. we wouldn't have it any other way. Um, so just sort of on that topic, uh, can you tell us more about this production's journey from its beginnings? I think it started at, as a workshop piece at Brown and then it came here to the public and there's a whole bunch of places in between in Chicago and now it's going to Broadway. Um, can you tell us some about some of the challenges and maybe what's changed about the piece? Oh, um, naturalism is really, really hard to write. Um, uh, it's... You know, because I always used to think that just naturalistic plays were bad, you know, because I saw so many of them. And now I know it's just because they're so hard to write. Because, you know, in a naturalistic play, any tiny thing you change is going to affect, like, a hundred other things in the play. It's not like that in experimental theater, at least not for me. You know, you can change something without everything just collapsing. Um, and so uh, it's just very, very, like, slow painstaking, methodical work, and you have to care a lot about character. I don't care at all about character, so that is a huge challenge for me with naturalism. And my dramaturg, Mike, would constantly be like, why does this character do that? Like, why does this happen? I'd be like, I don't know, I don't care. And be like, you have to figure it out. And I'm like, I'm not interested in that. Like, I just want him to do a dance now. And he's like, no, like, you, in naturalism, like, you have to, there has to be something he wants. And I like, I don't care what he wants. Like, don't, don't, why are you talking to me? like this you know and so that was basically the process of making straight white men fantastic well on that note we're going to open it up for um questions from the audience um and when you do ask a question into the microphone can you hold it like really close to your face because this is being live streamed so we're, we care about that um but yeah any any questions Hi, um, my name's Heather and I'm here in the program and we've kind of crossed paths a couple times. I was at TCG and you had left and anyway, I saw Songs of a Dragon here and then I was in Berlin when you were touring it there at Howl. And I just wanted you to talk, if you would, about your international reception. Oh, yeah. Um, so the, um, my identity politics shows have been very popular in Europe <laughs> and, um, and at the bar afterwards, I always sort of get the same response, which is like, oh, it's so, it's so hilarious how you Americans have all these race problems. <laughs> like, in, in Europe, like, we don't have these problems at all, you know? Like, you, it, it, like they're watching some sort of, you know, um, uh, you know, some sort of, like, rare zoo exhibit of race problems, you know? And, um, you know, in the meantime, like, their whole, you know, their whole, uh, 
um, you know, Middle Eastern kitchen, their whole uh, Middle Eastern kitchen staff is like so enraged all the time, like over, you know, like we're in the cafeteria and they're like telling us how racist everybody is at this theater um, and how enraged they are all the time. So um, we actually, um, there are, uh, at, in the shipment at least, like there's like an insert for European audiences where like um, in, in the stand-up act, uh, the stand-up comedian like, you know, targets something directly at uh, European um, audience members. So, I, I mean, that's been sort of the biggest thing that I've noticed is just, um, you know, a real delight in, um, in sort of engaging with a, a piece of art that, um, uh, that concerns race without having any idea that it, um, that they also have a relationship with race in their own country. Hi, uh, I'm Nick and I'm also in the program. Um, I, I hope you'll forgive a semi-theoretical question. Um, <laughs> I'm struggling between two of them and I guess I just have to pick one. Um, I guess, so your work deals a lot with um, issues that are political. Is, uh, do you think that there is an imperative for artists to deal with political issues or is that just something that interests you? Um. I think, uh, you know, I, I've I've made I've made plays that deal with identity politics, and I've made plays that um, that really don't like. We're gonna die is one that doesn't um, that that's sort of purposely um, as sort of generically human as as I can make it. I mean, I. <laughs> So I'm I'm sort of obsessed with this uh, communist rapper named Boots Riley right now. Who um, uh, he he just had a, a film at Sundance that's going to be coming out soon that I'm really excited about. And um, and uh, he has a very interesting theory about how um, all of the communists from the old days, you know, when communism was strong in the U.S. Um, and people like you know were literally card carrying members of the Communist Party that they um, that you know in the aftermath of McCarthyism they all fled into academia and the arts and um, so now we've got um, you know all of these universities and all of these you know nonprofit organizations and we've got all these artists who are just you know all the radicals are are just as radical as can be um, and yet academia and the arts are are not um, uh, they're not well equipped for actual organizing. Um, you know, as you can tell from like any graduate students who attempt to strike anywhere, you know, like it's, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's very um, challenging. And so I guess, you know, where my thinking is now is that um, I think that, you know, it's great if people can make art that makes people feel very strongly about things that are happening in the world and that can um, make people angry about injustices that are happening. Like I think that art is very good at doing that. Art is good at depressing people and making them mad about things that they should be mad about and that they should be depressed about. But when it comes to like actual change, um, I, um, you know, like I sort of think that having some sort of, um, uh, having some sort of community organizing practice is sort of like, you know, Boots Riley says, like that's the most important thing for, you know, for an artist, for an academic, for anybody, is to have some sort of practice where you are organizing people to, um, <laughs> to basically withhold, um, you know, withhold your labor, um, because that's sort of the only power that we have right now. So I'm, so I guess my answer to that would be, I think that um, uh, it is, it's awesome if you're an artist and you can make this work that gets people emotional and riled up about things that um, we need people to be riled up about. But if anything's actually going to happen, um, uh, I think, you know, because like, you know, our, our demonstrations are going unheard, you know, like uh, there's, it's, it's um, I don't know, I guess I agree with Boots Riley that, uh, that withholding our labor, figuring out how to tie that um, to uh, tie, tie the withholding of our own labor, not, not only to uh, the circumstances of our own um, working conditions, but also to causes that 
uh, that we believe in, uh, that that's sort of like our only source of power right now. And so I guess that's, that's, that's my thinking. Anyone else? I just wanted to go back to your, hi, I'm Margaret. I'm also in the program, hello. Um, I just wanted to go back to your um, pedagogy statement about babbling and spacing out. Did you mean your babbling and their spacing out or their babbling and your spacing out or both? And how are you, and, how, and if it's both, kind of how are you circulating that or dealing with that? Um, I mean, everyone's gonna babble, you know? Like that's just sort of human, you know, like, uh, you know, it's, I think it's very difficult not to babble at all. And I think that if you are so restrictive that you, when you're just like, I am not going to babble, you know, a, you know, a single word of babbling, then you're just not going to speak. So it's, it's not really that you're not allowed to babble. It's more just like if you have this idea in your head that, um, that you're not supposed to speak without trying to communicate a point, um, I think that's what... Um, really reigns in some of the really bad babbling, you know, which is when, um, you know, when people just range from topic to topic to topic to topic and they just get further and further away from what the point is. Um, and, um, yeah, I think... Uh, I, is that answering your question? Like, I don't know if that's... Yeah. Oh, um, yes, there definitely, there definitely is. Um, you know, and I think this is, this is exactly the kind of conversation that I, that I have with my students, actually, you know, which is you bring up some rule and then there's like immediately 20 different reasons why that rule is a problematic rule. And um, uh, so, yeah, like that, that, uh, that's absolutely right. I think that babbling is useful. I think that we do do it. But I do think, I guess what I would say is it's very useful to say in a room there's no babbling. Um, uh, because it gets people to be a little bit more aware of what's happening in the room. And is this, this is a graduate level seminar? No, this is, this is under, this is under. Because I'm, I'm, I wish my undergrads would babble more. <laughs> Silence. Um, are, there, are there any other questions? Do we have time for one more, Hansel? Yeah, Kieran. Hi, I'm Kieran. I'm in this program. And Ryan Donovan, who's also in our program, asked this question in our online space, and I second it, so I'm asking this question on behalf of him. So you made most of your work public in your website, the recordings of it, and I want to hear more about, more about how you decided to make that public. Oh, um, well, I closed down my company, um, you know, within the past, about a year ago, I decided, I made the decision to close down the company. Um, you know, I had been writing, directing, and producing my own work for about 13 years, and um, it was just, uh, you know, being an artist and running a business is uh, really difficult, um, and uh, it just didn't make any sense anymore. And so when I closed down the company, I... Um, you know, I wanted to make the work accessible to um, to people who would not otherwise be able to see it. And, you know, actually you can make so much money off of DVD sales from academic, you know, because like universities will just pay like $500, like, oh, that's the price? Like, okay, we have the budget for that, you know? So <laughs> it's, um, so there, there actually was a sort of, um, for a while we were making money um, off of universities uh, selling the DVDs, but um, I realized that um, I wanted, you know, I had this pipe dream of some kid in a small town somewhere stumbling upon it and, um, and getting to see it, you know, without having to go through any, um, 
uh, without you know having to pay or anything like that. And so, and actually, on the boards um, who recorded the the video of the shipment, they were amazing because they are selling that. I mean, they shot that to sell, so they're selling it on their website, and they let me put it on my website for free, even though they're still selling theirs, just because they're so awesome and they're so artist friendly, and they just got it, you know. And I, and um, yeah, and accessibility is actually something that I worry about a lot these days um, because with my company, we would tour around to these very sort of um, highbrow venues, you know, like the Pompidou in Paris, and you'd get all of these, you know, intellectuals and fancy people. And, um, you know, and I, I was interested in reaching people who weren't just, just that. Well, I know a lot of us use those resources in our classrooms, so we're very grateful for that as well. Um, thank you so much for this public interview and for being here and receiving this award. We are just so happy to have you here. And a round of applause for young Jean Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kyun Kim. I have been teaching speech communication at Baruch College for two years. So I guess I'm supposed to be very good at public speaking by now. <laughs> because I always emphasize how important it is for my students. But just to be very honest with all of you, this is my first speech of commemoration. And I'm so honored and glad that my first testimonial is dedicated to you, Yeonjin Ni, my longtime artistic and academic inspiration. I first saw Yang Jin Lee's performance in April of 2013 with Han Sol at the intimate theater space at Tucson Art Center in Seoul. We were about this distance back then too, but that time you were on stage wearing your signature navy sweater and yellow pants, performing We Are Gonna Die as a part of theater festival. I was just a 23-year-old MA student in the English program at Korea University who was also interested in writing a dissertation about Shakespearean performance. And I sang along with you, I'm gonna die, in the auditorium. I would never have imagined that one day, five years later, I would be recounting that moment in front of you and in front of all my colleagues and in front of all the rest of the guests tonight at the Booth Award. Now I'm the third year doctor theater student here at the Graduate Center. And again, you have become the first Asian American woman playwright whose work is to be produced on Broadway soon. After almost three years of, of theater going experience in New York, I've learned that how liberating and how rare it is to have strong female, female presence on stage and also off stage. Like you, like Diana O oh here today, and like all my colleagues who performed or organized this event today. I do not want to label or limit your achievement by calling you simply an Asian or a Korean American or even a female artist. As you also said in a recent interview with Rich Smith that, and I'm quoting, just the mere fact of my contributing to diversity on Broadway is not enough. But I do appreciate your direct and playful challenge of the stereotypical representations of Asians or Asian American identities, which can never be separated from gender and power dynamics. In Songs of Dragons Flying to Heaven, one of the characters named Korean American says, and I quote, have you ever noticed how most Asian Americans are slightly brain damaged from having grown up with Asian parents? <laughs> Asian people from Asia are even more brain damaged, but in a different way <laughs> because they are the original monkey. As an original monkey, <laughs> By which I mean Asian, Korean, female, non-US and international student. I'm so excited to see how embracing of my own identity would help me through my academic journey. 
your work and career has taught me that I don't need to reflect on the westernized education I received back in Korea in English department, but also to unlearn the white male gaze inside me and also to challenge and complicate the white male narratives in arts and academia. But I admire you more because your work is not only limited to Asian or Korean perspectives. As you're not afraid of exploring the identities beyond your own and bold enough to playing with identity politics. When I applied for the PhD program here, I wrote in my personal statement that, and I read, witnessing Young Jin Lee's theater company's work as a starting point, I will further delve into playwrights and theater practitioners whose work extends beyond the confines of their own ethnic, racial, or cultural backgrounds. I sometimes feel really pressured to represent Korean theater or Asian theater because that's what people in the US often expect to hear from me. But you give me your courage to keep moving on and do what I love to do beyond the narrow confines of what we call identity. Let me conclude by sharing a moment I encountered in my first year. I was writing a paper on your play, Lear, in Professor Marvin Carson's contextual and intertextual studies in drama class. As, a, as some of you might already know, Young Jin Lee's Lear is an absurdist, funny, serious mixture of Shakespeare's King Lear and Sesame Street. <laughs> and more than halfway through the play, Paul, the actor playing Edgar, removed Edgar's false mustache and beard and speaks directly to the audience, saying, and I quote, what are you doing with your life? Every minute, every second of the day, this is your one chance. What are you doing? What are you doing here? <laughs> it's is this really what you want to be doing with your life? <laughs> Being here, doing this? <laughs> if not, <laughs> then go, run. Run away and do something better. Paul asks the light operator if they can bring down the st stage light and remains off stage for at least a full minute. When he comes back, he remarks, and I quote, we shut out people's pain when we are not in pain ourselves. This part struck me then, and it still resonates me a lot. Not only because it made a striking transition from the Elizabethan tragedy to the stories of our loss, pain, remembrance, and responsibility in the play, but even more because it questions our own existence, purpose of living, the meaning of life, the, the meaning of living the life you want to live until we're gonna die. Sometimes, whenever I feel like an imposter in academia, as many of women and people of color often do, I go back to this passage, think, and even dream about running away to see if there's something better than being in theater or in classroom. But I find myself always returning to theater, to home, like this moment, because that's where we do not shut out other, other people's pain. And your work has taught me that theater is where we find joy, even in the moment of despair. We can dance crazily like the characters in straight, straight white male, even in the moment of depression. And where we can learn that we're going to die, but keep moving on to live the life fully. Young Jin, you taught me to embrace my own identity, but only to transcend it. Congratulations again on receiving the Booth Award. I can't wait to see you. I can't wait to see where you will be in five years, and I hope our path will cross again. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you enjoyed the moment. Thank you. Uh, it is
is now my great honor to welcome back of our guest of honor, Young Jin Lee, and present her with the plaque as a commemoration of tonight's ceremony. Have a special guest performance. Diana O oh and Matt Park will be performing "I'm Gonna Die" from a song from Young Jin's uh, cabaret piece "We're Gonna Die." Who, um, who saw "We're Gonna Die"? Yes. <laughs> who remembers? Um, I, I remember. That's a leading question. I'm just going to I remember. I remember so distinctly. Like the thing that stays with me forever is how Young Jin Lee danced in it. <laughs> like that's the thing that's like with me forever. Did that happen for anybody else? Or is it like, no. no. <laughs> it was just a really distinct like, this thing. And then she'd like recover and do like a hair thing. <laughs> um, cool. So uh, this is Matt Park. Hi, Matt. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Diana. Hi. And hi. <laughs> and we are clearly two people and not a full band. So we're going to cover the shit out of this song. <laughs> and we decided that, um, yeah, that, I mean, us coming together to put this cover together, we were like, yeah, we're going to be a punk band. And our punk band is going to be called Cute. <laughs> Look the, at the gift you gave us, young Jean <laughs> Um Great. OK, let's do a vocal warm-up, because we're all going to sing together by the end of this, right? OK. <laughs> You're all sheep. <laughs> um, OK. <clears throat> oh. How are we with line checking? Line sound good? Great. Someday, then I'll be gone and I'll be okay. I'm gonna die, gonna die someday, then I'll be gone and it'll be okay. I'm gonna die, gonna die someday, then I'll be gone and it'll be okay. I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die someday, then I'll be gone, and it'll be okay. Someone will miss me, someone will be so sad, and it'll hurt, it's gonna hurt so bad. Someone will miss me, someone will be so sad, and it'll hurt. It's gonna hurt so bad I'm Gonna die, gonna die someday Then I'll be gone, and it'll be okay I'm gonna die Gonna die someday, then I'll be gone, and it'll be okay. I'm gonna die, 
gonna die someday Then I'll be gone And I'll be okay I'm gonna die Gonna die someday Then I'll be gone And I'll be okay Someone will miss me And someone will be so sad And I'll hurt Yeah, it'll hurt so bad Someone will miss me Someone will be so sad and it'll hurt And it'll hurt so bad But we can live forever We can keep each other safe from harm We're alive but we can live forever We can keep each other safe from harm We're alive but we can live forever We can keep each other safe from harm We're alive but we can live forever We can Keep each other safe from harm. We're gonna die. This is where you come in. We're gonna die. 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 We are going to. for such a wonderful performance and um, thank you all for joining our celebration this evening on your way out please consider buying one of our new DTSA tote bags uh, which help raise money for events like this and uh, we'll have a reception upstairs in our theater program green room so please follow our students to uh, upstairs and yeah please join us for refreshments and we hope to see you next spring for the 37th annual Booth Award event. Thank you.